Hello, I am Daniel James Sharp. I'm an independent writer and a recent contributor to Marion West, uh, for which I wrote an essay about uh, science and literature and literary science, uh, which was also a review of the physicist Lawrence Krauss's new book, The Known Unknowns, or The Edge of Knowledge, The Unsolved Mysteries of the Cosmos. Uh, today, I'm joined by Lawrence himself on behalf of Mary Ann West for a discussion about his book. So thank you, Lawrence, for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm glad we uh, the technology is working. Yes. Well, let's hope it keeps working. Yeah. Um, I thought I'd start by taking a couple of couple of minutes to read the first few paragraphs of your of your book, which I think set the scene quite nicely. Oh, OK. Uh, so from the foreword, um, this shouldn't take any more than two minutes. OK. I am available as an audio book uh, narrator. <laughs> Thanks. Where do you have the audio? <laughs> Thanks. Three of the most important words in science are I don't know. Therein lies the beginning of enlightenment, because not knowing implies a universe of opportunities, the possibility of discovery and of surprise. If history is any guide, there is a lot more about the universe that we don't know than we do. Sometimes that is incorrectly taken to imply that we know almost nothing. In truth, we know a great deal and that guides us in our search to learn more. But the recognition that many cosmic mysteries still remain provides a long-term hopefulness to scientific enterprise, not to mention a kind of cosmic job security. The limits of the world, we understand, have moved further and further beyond the universe of our direct experience over the past 500 years of modern science. Yet the fundamental mysteries of existence persist. How did our universe begin, if it even had a beginning? How will it end? How big is it? What lies beyond what we can see? What are the fundamental laws governing our existence? Are those laws the same everywhere? What is the world of our experience made of? What remains hidden? How did life on Earth arise? Are we alone? What is consciousness? Is human consciousness unique? Skipping forward a few paragraphs. This book, I hope, will be a celebration of knowledge rather than of ignorance. It is an invitation to ponder and appreciate the universe in which we live. So with that said. Um, yeah, well, that OK, good. Thank you for reading that. Uh, with that in mind, as I said, I think that sets uh, up a conversation about your book quite nicely. Um, yeah, okay. Would you mind starting by telling us a little bit about um, well, about yourself, your background? I think you mentioned in the book that um, that you actually started with a scientific interest in neuroscience. So, you know, how did you first of all come to be interested in science, but also um, specifically, how did you come to um, uh, you know, be a practitioner of, of physics. Well, okay, actually, my while while that while I wanted to be while the first job I wanted to be was a neurosurgeon because that's all I knew. I mean, I didn't know anything about science. Neither of my parents went to college, and neither finished high school. In fact, uh, they wanted me to be a doctor, my brother to be a lawyer. My brother became a lawyer, which made it even worse when I didn't become a doctor. <laughs> but um, so, but in fact, my first interest in in, in Science had nothing to do with biology. It was really physics. Um, and um, I had a neighbor who's, who was an engineer and his son was there. And, and I remember he built a model of an atom, which he gave me and fascinated me. But uh, what I think, it's hard to know, of course, when one is young, but you know, I knew I, I wanted to be interested in science and I was sort of interested in all kinds of science without knowing what it was. But I, I do remember reading a book about Galileo when I was 11 years old that did that did stick with me uh it, it stuck with me because galileo seemed heroic fighting the forces of darkness in a sense and and uh and i found that very um uh attractive and so i think that that's sort of what got me started um and then i i started reading in, in any and all signs i could and 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 uh, books uh i got a subscription to a to a uh, series of books, I think Time Life books on science. I read them. I remember getting a subscription to Psychology Today, which was a magazine that had just started because their 
I could think about the brain, which I thought I was going to be interested in. And then it was books by Isaac Asimov and, and, and Einstein and then, and then and George Gamow and then, uh, then ultimately Richard Feynman. And by that point, you know, uh, my fundamental interest in physics had already begun. It sort of seemed fundamental, probably driven by the romantic view of Einstein, you know, thinking about solving the deepest problems of humanity. And, uh, and, and that grew. So I, I certainly, by the time I was in uh, early high school, physics had become uh, my major interest. And I took biology um, in, in high school and I dropped it because at the time I took it, which was way a long time ago, because I'm old, um, biology wasn't interesting at all. It was, uh, it, it was memorizing the parts of a frog and things like that. It was mostly memorization and I just dropped it because it just, I couldn't see the interest. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that devastated my mother at the time, but that was sort of the first decision not to be a doctor. Um, and, and, but I still didn't know. I mean, I, I you know, I, I really didn't know enough about science. I knew I was fascinated by all the questions of science, but I was equally fascinated with most other areas of human intellectual activity, to be frank. I read voraciously. I liked history. I, I read fiction. <laughs> so I, I wanted to do everything, but I did have a fundamental love of, or fascination with, 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 with science. And, um, but because I was interested in humans, and human and history and I was always I think political as well it wasn't clear to me that physics is what I wanted to do because it seemed so divorced from humanity so when I entered university although I, I mean I, I eventually got into these special science programs for good students but first in my city and then in the country and of course that you know reinvigorated my interest in, 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 in well not just reinvigorated it fostered my interest in science and physics but when I entered university, I actually took a program where I could do history as well as science, because I liked history, I liked Canadian history. And I did that for a while, and, and actually then took a year off school to work on a history book. And then when I, after I, I, I massed all the material for that book, I decided to go back and then focus on physics and mathematics, because that was, seemed like the most interesting course in my university. And, and then did that, I got a double mate degree in physics and mathematics, and was interested in philosophy too. I, too young to know any better <laughs> and um and um thought of going i almost took a road scholarship to go to oxford to do philosophy of science i'm glad i or philosophy and physics anyway because i was i in high school i was really influenced by a book by sir james jeans called physics and philosophy and i think that really strongly interests me but i, I didn't do that and i eventually decided to go to the united states to do graduate work and uh and and got into mit and <laughs> I uh, didn't expect a job, but it was what I wanted to do. Anyway, that's probably enough. Uh, well, can I, can I, um, you brought up something there. Can I ask, uh, just as a side note, what was the history book about? About what? The history, the history book. book? I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. By the way, if this is a video, I don't know if it is, you can see the bump on my forehead while I was just outside. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite aware of it. I just hit myself into a, into a door, actually. <laughs> Anyway, um, but my history book was on actually, actually a book I'm, I'm starting again now I amassed the material 50 years ago and left it, I, I wanted to, it was on the Communist Party in Canada in the depression in the depression. It was a very fascinating event that happened there, and I wanted to I got access and no one had ever gotten access before to restrictive material about a trial associated with the Communist Party and I wanted to interview the people associated with that who were still alive. Um, at that time, and so I, well, I, I, I took the year off and got on and spent the year in the archives in, in Ontario and in, in, in the National Archives, got all the material and in the interviews, and then once I had that, I knew I could, I could go on and had that, and I still have it in a big box that I'm actually looking at in my study across from where the computer is right now, and I plan to open it up, and I believe it'll be my next book. Oh, great. Well, I look forward to that. That will be an interesting departure. Yeah, it'll be an interesting departure. It's going to take me a long time to, I think, retool again, but I, it, I owe it to my history teacher at the time. And I think <laughs> it's a fascinating episode, I think, so it'll, it'll mm -hmm. make for an interesting story. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, you've been doing science for a long time, um, and you've also been publishing books for the general public about science for a long time. Yeah. Um, 
so I'm interested. I wonder what, like, what, what, what inspired you? What prompted you to um, write for the general public and to break out of the the ivory tower, as it were? Well, I guess I guess I always liked writing, although I, I don't. I never envisaged or thought of myself as a writer. I guess, but I I, I used to write when I got angry, and I used to write op eds even in high school. I mean, even in uh, graduate school, not high school. They never got published, but. Um, but I think what there were two things. First of all, I think it was I was what turned me on to science was was people like Richard Feynman and other people, you know, people George Gamma, people who had written books, and so returning that favor was certainly, I guess, in the back of my mind. I, it was what had turned me on, and maybe I could return the favor to young people. But actually, I think what really happened was what 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 caused that ultimately occur is that I, 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 after graduate school, I was lucky enough to get a very fancy position at Harvard University. And it was a position that, in a, in a thing called the Society of Fellows, where I really had no responsibilities, but to do whatever I wanted. And, and, and there were people from all disciplines and it encouraged interdisciplinarity. So I was working on physics, but I thought, okay, this is a chance for me to sort of think about writing, doing something else and writing a book. And uh, a, a colleague, uh, first a teacher of mine, and then later a colleague, Stephen Weinberg, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, had written a wonderful book called The First Three Minutes. It's a great book. I still recommend it. Um, and, uh, and I was talking to him, and he was meeting his publisher, and he, he recommended I have a meeting with his publisher. Um, and, I, and I did, and uh, Martin Kessler at Basic Books. And Martin Kessler talked me into writing a proposal to write a book. Um, and I did, and I thought I would write it while I was in the Society of Fellows. I didn't, as it worked out. I, it was a very pretentious book that I had imagined writing, um, popular book. Um, I later put it aside because I wrote a, I wrote a, a, a Scientific American article on dark matter in the universe, and there was such interest in that that I thought I could write a book on this subject. There isn't any book, and, I, I, and, I, and I, it's an area of my own research. And uh, by that time, I'd moved to become a professor at Yale. Um, but I'd, uh, I put aside the first book and signed a contract to do that, to do that book, which became my first book called The Fifth Essence. And, um, you know, it was just that there was so much interest. I, I, based on the Scientific American article, I gave up not a public talk, but a talk at the, what was then called the American Association of Advancement of Science meeting. And journalists were fascinated by it. And, and I thought, wow, this is of interest to the public. Let me see if I can write it. And I did write it when I was a, a, a assistant professor at Yale. It took me a couple of years. Anyway, and so it's sort of the, like many things in my life. It's just seeds that I planted that I didn't know where where they would go. And, um, and so here we are. And I, I found it. I found you know the writing fascinating. I guess I should I should step back because I skipped something very important. I've always been interested in 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 sort of the public understanding of science. And what really fostered that, and, and I really should have said this earlier because it's, it's probably as important to my writing as anything else, is I worked at a science museum when I was in high school called the Ontario Science Center. I did 10 shows, and ultimately I did 10 shows a day of these different things from electricity and lasers. And I learned, it's like, it was like a training in vaudeville. I learned over that time what, what kind of explanations would, would be acceptable to people, what people were interested in, what they weren't interested in. And that was incredibly important to me, I think, in terms of later on my writing, that that sort of trial by fire of, uh, of, of working directly with the public and learning how to explain things and getting great joy out of doing it. I think that that feedback that I really enjoyed it continued with me. I mean, of course, when I was in graduate school, I was doing other things. But I think that 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 bug of, of trying to explain things and, and, and to the public was was sort of germinated when I was at, worked at that museum. And then later on uh, started to come to, to fruit and when, when I had the opportunity. So I think that was a big factor. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and as I said, here, here we are. It's strange, uh, the, the, <laughs> the roads. Uh, yeah, it's strange roads. roads. And I've done that my whole life. I, I, I've tr done certain things and 
And you never know what's going to work and what doesn't isn't. It's even in my scientific papers, you never know what's going to be significant. Um, and I should say, after that book, the first book, did miserably. I, you know, I so I sold. It's like it's a collector's item now, and um, <clears throat> and I didn't know if I was going to write another book, but I decided to um, take that pompous book that I I was writing at Harvard and turn it into something much less pompous, which became my second book fear of physics and um and i and i plugged away and wrote that and um and that that didn't do that well either tell but it did better a little bit better and um and but the difference was that then i i i had by then i had a new editor at at, at basic books and it was really uh, uh in discussing with her i was at yale they were in new york so i used to go to new york regularly and um her daughter was a trekker and and um one day she said what about you know like something like the physics star trek i said you're crazy and and i and 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 um i'd watched star trek growing up i watched a tremendous amount of tv I, i'll say, add that too i watched everything on tv and i think tv turned out to be useful for me i learned a lot from it it wasn't bad i learned a lot from it because i also read a lot at the same time but it gave me a cultural background that i wouldn't have had otherwise i think but anyway um so i'd seen all the original star trek like I'd seen most things. It wasn't that I was fixated on Star Trek. And it was on the train back from New York to New Haven when I started to think, well, you know, how would I make a transporter? And, uh, and, and then I thought, well, what would you have to do? And it's, and it started, and the, the idea grew on me and grew on me. And, and, and then when I, by the time I got back to New Haven, I contacted her and I said, well, you know, this might work, but it was terrifying. I wrote a proposal and signed a contract and I'd never seen an episode of the next generation. <laughs> Um, and and the, the next thing I had to do for, and I was terrified of alienating, you know, not scientists of the public, but 70 million Star Trek fans, you know. <laughs> so the next thing I had to do was watch every episode, every episode of The Next Generation, yeah. which now sounds like a trivial thing to do because of the internet, but the internet didn't exist then. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, our, our, and, and so what I discovered, which was fascinating, was that if I walked down the street, um, I could ask 10 people and, and I'd find one who had every episode of Star Trek on videotape. And, and eventually I found someone who was willing to, to mail them to me and let me re watch them. So for three months from midnight to five in the morning, I watched every episode of that and to get and took notes, which at the time seemed like, why am I, why did I do a PhD? So I'd be sitting watching. But anyway, and then and then ultimately it was to, it was difficult to decide how to write that book, but that's a different book. So, but anyway, that 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 became, I guess, relatively phenomenally successful and 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 changed things for me. Yeah. So, um, as you said, yeah, as um, actually, just before we delve deep into the known unknowns, um, I did want to ask one quick question. As you know, I have a um, particular interest in. Christopher Hitchens and, yeah. and your, not your last book, but your la last before last book, yeah. um, The Greatest Story Told So Far, which is um, about particle physics and the standard model. Um, you uh, mentioned that you wrote some of that at uh, Christopher Hitchens' desk. So I, I wanted to ask about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Christopher, well, I was lucky to be a friend of Christopher's, as I've said many times. Christopher was actually writing the foreword for my book, A Universe of Nothing, when he got ill, and he was halfway through the foreword when he was very ill, and I, and I, I tried to convince him that I would just take what he'd written, and he said no, he he wouldn't going to give me anything that wasn't complete. He told me what he was writing, and I thought it was brilliant, but he unfortunately died before he could finish the foreword, and I was really sad about that. But, but. Um, uh but then later his his widow carol um her her, her father um uh, lived in california and i was out in california and, and um and 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 staying with him and uh for a little while and i was right near the end of the book and and his study was out there when, when they used to spend the summers out there and i said can i just sit here and write and yeah and it felt like you know of course it felt like i was channeling christopher i that would be lovely but because he was such a wonderful writer but it was it was a, it was a, for me a, a very a, a very uh, moving experience to finish that book in in his study. Well, uh, I know you're writing a book on Christopher, and 
you can all and, and that story is free to use <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for indulging me there um no worries so to uh, get into uh, the new book the known unknowns uh what why why that subject um what made you want to tackle that subject oh it's hard to know for sure i mean i've written a, uni a universe from nothing um and uh um and that was, you know, obviously a very successful book, but it it, it really dealt with the with a, a a question that was central to, you know, humans and religion. You know, why is there something rather than nothing? And this notion of fundamental questions, of course, it clearly been of interest to me. And in each of my books, I try to think of a hook because I I want people who may not know they're interested in science to to pick it up because they are interested. People are interested in science; they just don't know what science they're interested in usually. Uh, and my and it was my British publisher, um, head of Zeus, uh, uh, who produced the known unknown. So the the, the 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 British version of the book, the American version is behind me, but the British version is here. Um, my publisher, who who published my last book, um, uh, the physics of climate change, approached me and said, well, you know, and and actually even suggested the title, the known unknowns, and and I and I immediately fell in love with the idea of focusing on the fundamental questions at the forefront of science that we don't understand what, what those questions that are driving us to explore the unknown and it was a very different kind of book when they first proposed it it was going to be 25 questions and 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 uh, you know like most of my books i agreed to do it and and actually and, and signed a contract and then the book takes a life of its own in a, in a way and 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 i really don't know what what the uh the real structure or, or, or flow of the book is going to be until I've after started writing it. And usually it takes me about, often it takes me 40 to 50% of the time of writing the book just to write the first chapter, because that's when I decide sort of the, wh where it's going. And I don't know, I don't remember when, but it's when I decided that really it's better to hit sort of five major areas, which are the area, the real areas of fundamental interest in science, but also the areas that people are fascinated by time and space and matter. And then the two major areas outside of that, that I think where, where humanity has its deepest questions and, and some extent hardest questions have to do with life and consciousness. I knew that would be um, ambitious and challenging because of course, uh, space, time and matter are related to physics, although in every book I write, I, I learn new things. Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth. Otherwise, it'd be the same book all the time. Um, but and and I'd run, I'd run meetings from the institute I I ran on on the origins of life. So I was, you know, at least I knew something about it. But I knew I'd want to update myself on that. And consciousness, I have several friends who are experts in in different ways. So people from Steve Pinker to, to Noam Chomsky who are who thought about science but but I, I've always been skeptical about books on consciousness I have a friend of mine who, who constantly she constantly reads books on consciousness and 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 this person's theory of consciousness and that person recommends them to me and then and I told her what I the, I, I think what I what I I think I say in the book which not made me skeptical which is, is what someone once said you can tell how much you understand how much is known about a subject by how many books are written about it the more that's known, the fewer the books, and uh, and there's a new book on consciousness coming out every week. So anyway, but I knew that would require a lot of work. So I think of all the chapters, I, I knew that the most demanding would be consciousness, and I'd have to read for pretty thoroughly to do a. Again, while I while I had a basic, some basic ideas, I really needed to do, to to do a lot of work, and that that was that was challenging and rewarding, and it and also very difficult because how to distill that. Um, but in the end, I think it came out okay. But anyway, I, I decided the five major themes really reflect the five major themes of what it is that interests people about the world and what the questions that every everyone has, not the ones that that, that that the very specific questions that scientists have, but the questions that everyone has. And it turns out the fundamental, the forefronts of science, the real outstanding questions turn out to be almost the same ones that, that everyone has. But the idea was to reach out to people Hey, you know, what happened before the beginning of the universe? What, can you travel in time? You know, all the, all these questions are, are, are we alone in the universe? And, and try and tap into those questions that 
that uh, that everyone has because uh, that otherwise you know why write a book because uh, unless you try and reach the people trying to understand where people are who have the questions yeah now that's um one of the uh, very attractive things about the book is that it um the beginning of each section you have a list of questions uh, of mysteries and you try to um show what we know about these things um and elucidate you know the mysteries that still remain the un the known unknowns um so you do take us right to the frontier of knowledge as it were yeah but one thing about i mean it's a hook right the yeah. unknowns for it is true that it's important as i say i don't know it's incredibly important words um and coming up with the questions at each at beginning of each chapter were important for me because i tried to think that would frame the chapter for me. So there were lots of possible questions and I tried to focus on them. And sometimes I changed the questions because it didn't go anywhere. But um, but of course it's a hook. You can't get to where the, for, the unknowns unless you kind of know what we know. So this was an opportunity for me to take people literally the edge of knowledge, which is how the American book got its title um, in, in all these different areas and, and, and get people to be motivated to learn about what we knew because they were fundamentally interested in the question of what we didn't know. And so, um, and, and that's why I thought it was a, a wonderful kind of sequel to, to, in a way, to the universe of nothing uh, and to the great story we're told so far, because, um, you know, I told the stories, stories of, uh, uh, of uh, at least I dealt with one of the big unknown questions, why is there something rather than nothing? And I thought this was a great, great sequel to do it. And it, I also frankly thought it could be, um, uh, since I was thinking of, of maybe it being my last science book, and we'll see if it is or not, um, I might as well try and, uh, and tackle, take people to the to the edge with that. And anyway, it, it served that purpose. Well, that, yeah, that would be a, a great climax. Uh, I didn't know you were considering that, but... Um... Well, yeah, well, I, I, I am for a variety of reasons, and we'll see uh, beyond my next, the, the book, next book, which will be history, what, what, I, what I do. I never know when I'm going to be doing it three or four years. I hope I never do. So, you know, so um, which of those then, which of the known unknowns or uh, the great mysteries, first of all, which one most excites you? The one that you most need to know the answer to. Like that, man, you probably <laughs> know from our last, the last time we yeah. talked. I, I don't think hierarchically about the world. I really think what is the most or what, you know, it's, it's apples and oranges. They all interest me at different times, depending upon the time of day. And, um, and what, what I'm working, what I'm thinking about. So, uh, obviously, okay, so what? I'll let, but, you know, look, I do begin with time because I do think that the nature of time travel is a fascinating issue. And also the nature, because I had asked that question, why is there something rather than nothing? The nature of the beginning of the universe is, a, I, most of my work has been in the very early universe. So thinking about that first instant is incredibly important to me. Um, and, um, and and then and then the, the 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 question of space is really an important one because it's changed the way we think about the world and my, what and the way I view science physics at least I went into physics thinking like most people and certainly like Einstein did that there must be well the, the Einstein asked this question which he phrased in a way that I don't like but in any case he asked the question did the good Lord have any choice in the creation of the universe? He didn't mean the Lord, but anyway, um, what he meant was, is, is, is there only just one law of physics going over, or there could be many possible laws of physics. And, and he, I think, assumed there was one law and he wanted to understand how that derived. And so did I, but the thing about the space chapter and then hopefully the matter chapter two is that we now think that maybe our universe is just one of potentially a, a, an infinite number of universes in which the laws of physics might be different and that's changed our whole perspective of the questions we ask um so i think that was a very the, the, un, understanding whether our universe is unique is a is a is an, an un, a known unknown to me that's a profound interest and i've actually thought of ways that one might be able to get an indirect handle on that um and i write about them in the book and i've written scientific papers on that and um uh and then the matter chapter, of course, the one of the biggest questions, which has been much of my career as well, is this strange fact, uh, which in one way or another, I and 
a colleague of mine first suggested that the energy of empty space might be the dominant energy in the universe and it turned out to be true um and we still don't know why i still have the slightest idea why and 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 that's probably the most profoundly deep question in my mind in physics i think understanding why that's the case is going to probably require a lot of a lot of knowledge about well it'll require some new thinking i think about gravity and uh, and the universe um and but part of that involves thinking about quantum mechanics and i've always wanted to write and i've done a little bit of this in some of my other books but i've always wanted to write um a little bit about quantum mechanics because it's done so badly often and it's distorted so much and so this gave me a chance to really regurgitate a lecture from my another friend and in some ways mentor too i never wrote a paper with him sydney coleman who was at harvard who died and was certainly one of the smartest people there and he gave a wonderful lecture called uh once shortly before he died called um, uh, quantum mechanics in your face which really pointed out what 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 i felt for a long time that, that all these people are writing about quantum mechanics and classical interpretations of quantum mechanics and making it sound all very fancy are, are really doing the wrong thing because the world is quantum mechanical and to explain it in terms of classical mechanics is a, is a kludge and it's okay but you're always going to come up with weird things because the world isn't classical and and yet and but to take that seriously is is ridiculous what we should be trying to understand is interpretations of classical mechanics because the world is quantum mechanical so to try and it's like trying to explain general relativity in terms of newtonian mechanics uh, why would you want to do that it's the other way around mm -hmm. and um so it allowed me to talk about some of the weirdness of quantum mechanics and how how, it, how you know how we know what it is and 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 uh and um and well, if i might uh, recommend if you do uh do another science book that should be the subject of a full-on explanation of quantum mechanics because that is i think still something that's uh, very difficult to get one's head around even even for um professionals i think was it was it Feynman who said uh, if you think you understand quantum mechanics you don't understand yeah quantum it, mechanics. it's true and it's it, it we know we know we, we can't understand it at an intuitive level because the world is, is quantum mechanical but we think classically so in fact, that's why Feynman also was became quite interested in quantum computing. He was one of the first to propose quantum computers. And his interest was he thought maybe quantum computers could explain quantum mechanics because they use quantum mechanics in their calculations, but in sort of not intuitively because it wouldn't be conscious, but could give us insights into quantum mechanics that would otherwise be impossible. It's probably true. I think one of the uses of quantum, quantum computers, and I talked about this recently with an old friend, John Preskill, who's become one of the leaders in quantum computing, and I, we did a podcast on it. You know, whatever quantum co computers will do, and there's been a lot of hype, I think most of it's hype, but but I think one of the first things they'll be able to do is indeed perform quantum mechanical calculations that we can't do otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that'll probably be their first major utility. And sort of, they're already beginning to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was, was interesting in quantum computers, was to give us insights into quantum mechanics. and. I don't know that I want to write a whole book on, on, on quantum mechanics, but but um, the, certainly, um, uh, I uh, yeah. I, in a sense, it would be a it, it would be a further expansion of Sidney Coleman's lecture, which I which I, I did already sort of. Oh, he, he was writing about it in a new book, but I'd have to I'd have to go beyond it, and 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 it, you know anyway, there's some brilliant things in there. So here's a more um, instead of a uh, which. Of these mysteries most excites you um this is a more objective question i suppose or by the way i haven't gotten um, to life and consciousness oh yeah <laughs> no i'm mean, going to say that you know, obviously the origin of life is still <laughs> fascinating and of course are we alone those are the two yeah. big questions and they do fascinate me hmm. and consciousness because i guess i was an, i was interested in neuroscience how they didn't know it was neuroscience obviously anyone who thinks about anything the brain is it's fascinating and and it's all, one of the reasons I didn't become a neuroscientist is because it's just overwhelmingly complex. Physics seems so much easier. Um, mm. And 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 we're only beginning to get a handle on that. And but that but obviously anyone who's interested in the world ultimately has to be interested in how it is we come to picture the world. What, this amazing accident that we have this awareness of the world and can speak about it and and exp and describe it is still the mis great in my mind perhaps one of the greatest mysteries of being human 
Yeah. Now I now I've completed my set. Now you can go on. Sorry. <laughs> well, closely related, um, um, but perhaps uh, as I said, in principle, more objective. Uh, which of the mysteries do you think is the most likely to be solved soonest? Well, you know, I don't make predictions. Obviously, if I knew, I'd be doing it, right? I mean, <laughs> okay. But but having said that, I think if I look at the areas where where we're clearly um, making great progress, and it is the origin of life, I think, and the and the possible knowledge of the possible existence of life elsewhere. Those are two fields where where, where there's tremendous amount of activity. Uh, where and as I described in the book, theoretically and experimentally, we're coming very close to thinking about how prebiotic, and I'm not sure even what that word means, but but you know how how chemistry turns into biology and there's a great deal of really interesting work that's non-intuitive that's being done there that may show us a pathway as my friend richard dawkins says maybe it won't show us it was the pathway unless it becomes so obvious that that is the unique way of doing it and i i think it may but but it, it may show us at least a, a plausible pathway for naturally creating the complex or um, polymers like rna that would might eventually lead to dna on the one hand, and then the fact that we're, we're we have the new James Webb Space Telescope and other telescopes that are, in principle, going to probe the atmospheres of other planets around other stars and maybe look for biosignatures, as well as sending missions, maybe to Enceladus or Europa and look under the oceans. And so I think it's possible in the next decade or two that both those questions may be at least uh, come close to being solved. But you know, there'll still be there'll still be other. The le as what's great about science is that when you answer one question, it produces uh, ten more. That's good. Well, one of the most uh, disappointing things when uh, we have these mysteries is, is when um, you think something's been solved, but it hasn't. And what came to mind as you were speaking there was the, you know, a couple of years ago, the Venus um, news that they thought they had discovered um yeah. life on uh, life on venus essentially and then it yeah well I, I wrote a piece about how astrobiology should be taken with a pound of salt i think almost all claims in astrobiology are suspect but it's just a very nascent field mm -hmm. but but it's not disappointing but sometimes we find that the problem the question we thought was the important question isn't the que fundamental question after all and that may be disappointing but it's really exciting because what it, it's what drives it's really what drives um science is, mm -hmm. is, is is sometimes realizing you're going up in, in this direction and you hit a brick wall but maybe the maybe the the question was a, not a good one but what you've learned it takes you allows you to go around it and look in a different direction and i think that's the really neat that's what's really most exciting is when is when you find out the you, new questions and it's really coming back to what i said about i don't know the i don't know thing leads us to questions and it's really it's asking the right questions, which is the real art of science. And sometimes you don't know you have, but it's the questions that derive the field. And I hope, and I think the questions that should be used to derive the way we teach the field as well. Okay, so let, let me veer slightly theological now. Uh, okay. Uh, as, as a, well, as Napoleon supposedly, or probably apocryphally said to Laplace, uh, where is God in all of this? Uh, where is God in all of your uh, science and calculations and such? Well, it, uh, 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 you know, I forget which of the map. I, I think I, I don't know if it was Poincaré or someone else who said, "I have no need of that hypothesis." Uh, who was it? It was a famous math, French mathematician. Yes, um, uh, Laplace. Yeah, Laplace. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I think that's the point. The God there's no it doesn't appear anywhere. And 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 you know it's and some people, particularly the Templeton Foundation, tends to make it appear as if these fundamental questions in science and religion are, are somehow close together and scientists ponder every day the existence of God and not of God. They don't. It never come it's never come up in my 40 years or so of being a scientist. I never heard the word God mentioned because you never you don't as far as we can tell, we don't need it. Maybe someday we'll discover that there's evidence you need to assume some divine intelligence, but we haven't so far. There's no evidence for it yet, and the, and really science is based on continuing to explore 
the natural workings of the universe and see if you can understand them in terms of natural laws. And, um, and so, you know, God gets pushed further and further away. And some people say, well, of course, God created the laws. And you can, you can, you can, you can imagine that kind of Spinoza and God maybe, but, but I, you know, I, I just think, um, the great thing is that you can, is, is the universe is as amazing as it is without all the fairy tales. It's more amazing. The universe is far more amazing than anything that's come up in any scriptural book, because the imagination of nature is much greater than the imagination of human beings. Well, I completely agree. But uh, if anyone has complaints, then do send them to uh, tell them to you, the Vatican. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So we we kind of touched there on uh, you know the differences between certain intellectual cultures and. You know, one of my focus focuses foci in the review is, um, you know, about literature slash the arts and science, and I do find it very dismaying the fact that there are so many artistic, literary sort of people who just seem to just don't get the allure of science. I mean, well, I, it's not just that. It's not just. I'm going to interrupt you. It's even worse than that. They're proud. Mm. It, it, and we have a culture where, where people can be proud of being scientifically illiterate. Mm. Oh, I just, oh, my mind doesn't work that way. Oh, I just can't get it. I just can't. And yet we would never accept these people to be leaders of, in any sense, cultural leaders. If they said, oh, you know, my mind doesn't get it. that writing thing. It's just, my mind doesn't get it, you know, and, and oh, art and music. Oh, you know, and, and the point is, what 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 people seem to miss the point of is that you can appreciate well be, it requires people to be able to explain it that way like and that's one of the reasons I do it but you don't have to be a scientist to appreciate science and in fact because the, this is not new I've said it many times but one of the one of the unfortunate features of science and it may not seem unfortunate at first glance is that it produces technology and the technology has changed the world because it ends up being that if if you do science that isn't related to technology people say what why should i care why should i care about the beginning of the universe why should i care about any of that and the point is it's it what to me what is the greatest legacy of science is not the technology that is produced but the ideas the the way it's changed our perspective of who we are and our place in the cosmos and in that sense it's identical to art, music, and literature, all, in all of which, no one ever says, "What's the use of what's the use of a of a Shakespeare play, or what's the use of Picasso painting, what's the use of a Eric Clapton guitar solo, um, or Mozart symphony, if you like to in that direction?" Because they're accepted to be on their own amazing, amazing leaps of the human intellect, mm. and yeah. and what makes it worth being human. And for me, science is a part of that. And if you knowingly turn that away you're turning away such a large part of what of, of, of modern humanity and we yet we we accept it we we encourage we actually say you're we actually reward people for claiming their scientific literate we say you're cultured and we allow them to you know and and again uh, the first time i wrote science books there i saw i got i had to read reviews of my books used to come out and it's good not to read them sometimes but but um you the first thing i realized is that you could read these reviews a really good science book review would be well it boggles my mind couldn't understand it but it was fascinating it just caused me to be go ah and that sounds good but you'd never accept a similar review of a of a, a history book or an economics book you know, I used to say in my day, John Kenneth Galbraith, but you pick your favorite economist now, but you know, you can imagine some literary journal. There's no way you'd have, a, they'd a, allow someone to write a review of an economic book saying, you know, it just bo I didn't understand it, it boggled my mind. Yeah. The person would have to actually claim to understand it, whether they did or not, because, you know, they'd, it requires thinking and hard work sometimes. And that's true of science, but you're allowed to just, Lays your mind over and not and not spend the time trying to puzzle it, but if you do, you miss out so much of the human experience that, that, that I feel sad for people. As somebody who comes from uh, the other side of the two cultures, um, 
you know, I mean, I've always been interested in science and loved science, but I've never been particularly um, academically gifted in that field to my great regret, but I've always read about it. I've always sought to understand that, it. That's what's great. Um, you can enjoy science without yeah. being, I mean, and, and that's why I write. I write for people like you. I mean, you can enjoy science and be amazed by science and just like it's, you can listen to beautiful music and, 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 um, and what a shame it is not to open yourself up to that. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's that two cultures thing. And I'm glad that, that you try and span it in one end as I, as I do in the other. So, um, uh, well, I have two more questions and I realize we're running out of time. Um, hopefully, well, this first one might be a bit <laughs> too, uh, too, too much to go into, but, um, one of my very small quibbles with the book was your uh, slight neglect of of uh, Darwinism in the chapter on life, uh, because you're more interested in the, the sort of physics, the abstract notions of life. Um, but yeah, I see yeah, yeah, Dawkins. Obviously, I disagree with it, but 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 let, but I'm happy to discuss it. Sure. Well, I mean, I just wanted to ask if uh, if you were familiar with Richard Dawkins's argument about universal. Um, Darwinism. Uh, oh yeah, no, we we are familiar. If you watch our d dialogues, you'll see we, we brought we bring it up. We, he's brought it up at least three times in dialogues we've had, saying you know what you know when you ask him what's life like in the universe. Well, I don't know, but I'm sure that it's driven by Darwinism. But I guess I I guess I agree with it so much. I find that self evident. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even know it's. I don't think it's worth repeating for me to repeat it. It's probably it's for him. That it it it, it obviously. It's a central feature of how life evolves, and therefore, you can't you can't imagine life anywhere without evolution, because it would be it would be the same as saying there's no there's no there's no drivers, there's no natural drivers to life. Uh, um, well, perhaps it's right. Life, you know, life. It's there's no selection effects. But how could there be no selection effects? To me, yeah. the more interesting question, which I, I I think I do discuss in the book. And it is a debate I've had with Richard, and he disagrees with, is whether, if you think about what's universal about life, obviously evolution is universal. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should have said it, obviously evolution is universal. It just seemed to me so obvious, I guess I didn't think of saying it. But, and maybe that's, that is a flaw, maybe I should have said it. But to me, the more interesting question is, is can life be different than, than life on earth? Almost Einstein's question, but as applied to life. Mm -hmm. and, and the more I've learned about the origin of life in the in the meetings I've run and listening to the the, the scientists who are working on it, I'm more willing to think that maybe there is just one one road to successful life and chemistry found it. And maybe all life in the universe has is is is, is the same basic, you know, building blocks of DNA and ATP as a as a as a as a molecule to drive uh, energy, that may sound very pedestrian and myopic to say that, but it could be. And certainly, life on Earth was driven by chemistry. And the question is, are there different routes? You know, that if you just happen to go on a different river, you know, you'd end up in a different way. Maybe, but it could. It's also equally possible to me that there is just one good route, and that's why I'd be fascinated to find life elsewhere. Where we knew it was a separate genesis and see mm. yeah but anyway i think i think you're right i didn't talk about it only because I, I guess i think of it as so as so as so central to life that obviously selection effects are perhaps i'm uh, just uh uh proselytizing for darwin <laughs> well no i love <laughs> that, that, I'm a huge i mean you know i think darwin's met one of the people up in my little list uh, here somewhere <laughs> anyway um my little guys my little finger puppets but um no yeah I, I mean darwin i actually went on a I, or i forget whether it was a debate but i i was happy to say that i think if you ask me who was the, and i hate to use the word greatest again but i i would say darwin was greater than einstein in the sense that darwin revol not only revolutionized our theoretical picture of of life and ourselves, but he was also an amazing experimental scientist. He did it because he did incredible years and years of painstaking observations. Mm. So he spanned both 
parts of science, where Einstein, as great as he was in changing our picture of the world, was a theoretical physicist and, and was not an experimental scientist. So, so Darwin, I think, if you think of as sort of who, as a scientist, characterized science the best, you know, before him, it might have been Galileo as, as, as the one that, or, may, or maybe Newton. Newton did experiments too, uh, so Newton or Galileo. No, no I, I should say, um, and perhaps I'm being overconfident here in uh, <laughs> trying to uh, correct you on a point, but the point about universal Darwinism isn't that, um, uh, you know, evolution is the only way for, for life to evolve, but a particular form, i.e. Darwinian natural selection is the only conceivable way in which particularly complex adaptive life in the universe can evolve. Um, you know, other mechanisms that have been proposed, such as Lamarckism in principle, can even work. Yeah. That's a kind of Dawkins' argument. Um, yeah, but I think natural selection is just, for me, it's physics. I mean, it, not mm. biology, it's physics. Natural selection is just saying, it's just like saying, water boils because I heat it, right? It's driven by the external environment. Natural selection says I have a biological system that may exist in a variety of different, different states and, 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 the, and the ambient conditions, physical conditions will determine which states survive. So I guess for me, it's, it's just, it's in my blood. Mm. Natural selection is, is, is the, it's so once, uh, once Darwin and all, Wallace, but Darwin in more detail, first, first, you know, explained it. It's one of these things It's obvious. Okay, absolutely. It's so clear that that's how everything works. And, um, and it turned it, it and I guess as a physicist, I love it because it's kind of a physical way of thinking of, of life. It's the external conditions that drive the chemistry to adapt, you know, to, to, to not adapt, but select that selects which but, and it requires that the chemistry have a variety of different forms that the genetic systems have that a population has a, 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 a you know a variations in its genome that's required obviously for it to be true well uh well there we go there we go that's me daniel sharp uh humanities okay. graduate trying to compete with lawrence krauss on oh, well, anyway it's good <laughs> it's a good point maybe in a future edition i'll add it um <laughs> but anyway to finish off then um as i see we're coming close to the end of our time uh, to go back to the two cultures then um uh since we've talked mostly about science what are your favorite um pieces of art music literature film tv even um that move you and inspire you well, again a favorite it's hard you know, i wish you didn't ask me these favorite things <laughs> I, I love, I, I, you know it's again i'm often surprised when i discover new new music new art new, you know i mean i, I happen a lot I, I, I happen to, as an artist. I happen to love Picasso's art, uh, and and uh, and and um, I, I happen to like the impressionists and and the, and the uh, Cubists um, period of art. Maybe the best uh, for me for a variety of reasons, um, and uh, and but I have some more modern artists too, and and. Um, and music, I have a kind of eclectic interest in music. I, I like mu all different kinds of music. Um, I think my favorite kind of music now, and it varies depending on my the year and my age, is, is the blues um, music. But uh, I, I, folk music was very important to me growing up, and I worked at a folk festival for a, for a bunch of years, and I managed to once, I even strummed Pete Seeger's banjo, which is, you know, for me, I like. And, and anyway, it doesn't matter what I did there, but I did some things there. And, um, and, and, but I, but I, I, I think, um, I, I like, I like to, I like to listen to new music channels because then I, I, I you know, I, I learn about new music, but rock music and rock and blues are probably still my favorite kind of music. My daughter is very, very talented violinist and 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 therefore i was involved for a long time in the classical music community and i was very happy to one of the ways to try and bridge that the two cultures is is i i i performed with the cleveland orchestra which was a highlight of a highlight of my life i guess is the word to say where i narrated holtz the planets uh with mm -hmm. images from nasa as the orchestra played holtz and i in between each movement i i, I did a narration and that was a a wonderful experience and so you know 
that that was a highlight and um and um literature you know also I, again i i um i tend to read nonfiction now more than fiction although often when i write a start a book i tend to read fiction i'm just listening and reading a book by kurt vonnegut and it reminded me how much i love kurt vonnegut but i mean I, obviously shakespeare i still think is amazing but but I've already said this to, when people ask me before, probably the most influential book in my life was a book by Joseph Heller called Cash 22, which helps. When I read it when I was probably 13 or 14 and, and um, it helped confirm to me the absurdity of life, which which continues to guide me. And on my good days, helps me, rec helps me deal with the nonsense that I see around me at all times. Well, I think that's a great place uh, to end on. Uh, it's a great book, as is The Known Unknowns, which I highly recommend um, uh, to anyone who is watching or listening or reading, or whatever the case may be. Um, so unless you have anything else that you're desperate to uh, impart. No, I wanted to hear what you were, but I thank you. I enjoyed your, I think, as I say, I thought your review was, was not only generous but uh, incredibly in my opinion astute and i'm really glad you you liked it happily the reaction so far has been very good to it you never know when you produce such a thing oh, thank but you i, I enjoyed talking to you here and this was again in many ways quite different than other interviews i've done so i hope i hope i don't know what form it'll appear in but um uh, but i look forward to seeing when it does appear and uh and i want to thank you for the time to do it well thank you lawrence uh and have a lovely Saturday evening. I'm not sure what time it is where you are, but it's quite late. For 6 30. I think it, I think it's time to figure out what we're gonna do for dinner. And I saw my wife come by and and uh probably have to finish cleaning up the lawnmower that I rushed in after after mowing. <laughs> well, I'll let you go and uh, do mowing that. of the year. Okay. <laughs> okay, you take care. And it's oh it's not only it's uh, speaking of evening, it's almost midnight there. It's eleven thirty there. Or let's see, it's it's ten thirty uh, there. Half past ten, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you still have some time for me. I'm a late owl, so 10.30 is a good time. Yeah, so am I, to be fair. I'm going to enjoy some nice wine now. <laughs> okay, have a good wine and, do, and have a good evening. And thanks again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Dan. You too, you too. Thanks.